Good morning. Good morning to all of you. That was the amazing Dr. Glenn Rideout, our music director at our church in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I'm so glad you're here with us today, either in the sanctuary or at home or on Zoom or on Facebook, or perhaps you're watching this later. Know that you are so welcome here. However you are here, whether it's your first time with us or your thousandth, whether you are here with us in the sanctuary or home in your pajamas, we are glad to be together. Today, we are going to be looking at how we as individuals and as a congregation can do more to be anti-racist. I was so glad to know that you voted last year to be an eighth principal congregation, but you do know that that's just a beginning, not an end. We will be working to make that commitment a reality. And I'm using today to start with some thoughts and a very challenging book that I've just read called Nice Racism that challenges white progressives like most of us to do better. However, last week's massacre in Buffalo steeped in hate, white supremacy and anti-Semitism made this service today more urgent. I wanna start this service by honoring these 10 people, these 10 lives that ended last Saturday when an 18 year old white supremacist shot up a community grocery store in Buffalo, New York. I'm not gonna say his name, but I want you to know the names of the people whose lives ended tragically on their routine trip to the grocery store. 
Harry's going to come up and light one candle for each of these people. In total, 13 people ages 20 to 86 were shot. 11 were black, two were white. The names of the people who lost their lives. Roberta A. Drury, 32, of Buffalo. Marcus D. Morrison, 52, from Buffalo. Andre McNeil, 53, from Auburn, New York. Aaron Salter, 55, of Lockport, New York. Geraldine Talley, age 62, from Buffalo. Celeste Cheney, age 65, from Buffalo. Hayward Patterson, age 67, from Buffalo. Catherine Massey, age 72, from Buffalo. Pearl Young, age 77, from Buffalo. Ruth Whitfield, age 86, from Buffalo. So I ask that you keep them in their honor and in their memory as we go through this service, as you think about how are we part of this problem and what more can we do individually and collectively. Our opening hymn this morning is sung by our choir, Amazing, and it is Amazing Grace. You may not know that Amazing Grace was written by a wealthy English man, a white English man who once owned slaves and then repented and became a leading abolitionist. He indeed once was lost and then found his spirit. So please now in the sanctuary, rise and body your spirit. You can stand up at home too, if you'd like, and join us in singing Amazing Grace with the UUFH Choir.
Good morning. My name is Terry Donaldson, and I am delighted to be your worship associate this morning. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Huntington Sunday Service. We have a few brief announcements. We are updating our assistive listening system. Our tech wizard, Harvey Balpole, will be installing a new FM transmitter, and we will be purchasing new receivers. If you use or would like to use our assistive listening technology, please see me after the service or reach out to me. My information is in the flash and on the website. Want to learn more about the proposal to establish a beehive on our, a honey beehive behind our Grow to Give garden? There will be an educational session with Valerie Skopas, our Grow to Give chair, and beekeeper Dawn Schmitz on June 5th after the service. And later that evening, they will have a Zoom to learn more about this. I think Valerie will be here after the service today if you would like to speak with her. The community risk level of transmission of COVID has risen to a high alert. Our reopening task force has responded by establishing guidelines for mask wearing at all times in our building. We've suspended the mask optional coffee and conversation and moved it outdoors to the Sam Phillips Garden patio. For more information about these announcements, as well as other activities at the fellowship, please see our e-newsletter, The Flash. And if you are not currently receiving The Flash, you can sign up for it at our website by clicking the tab, sign up for events and news. And now I invite you to settle into your bodies and quiet your minds as we breathe deeply together and enter into our time of worship. This is the time for our chalice lighting, the symbol of our faith. I invite you to light a chalice or candle in your own home as I read these words by Adrian L. H. Graham. Our Storm family, Vivian, Charlotte, and Marisol will light our chalice this morning. We kindle a flame of power, illuminating the holy in each of our faces. We recognize the flame, we recognize in the flame a passionate commitment to our shared faith. We are held and carried from day to day, week to week, in the shining of the light. This flame is mine as well as yours. We are brought together on this day, called to growth, to expansion within its glow. What does your heart know while beholding this holy fire? Please join me now as we say our mission statement. In religious community, we nurture our individual spirits through caring for one another and helping to heal the world. And together, let's join our choir in singing our affirmation. Danielle Burby. I am the Director of Religious Education at UUFH, and I would like to start today's Time for All Ages by introducing a video of our one of our senators, Ted Cruz, speaking about books. 
So, Judge Jackson, all of us will agree that, that no one should be discriminated against because of race. When you just testified a minute ago that you didn't know if critical race theory was taught in K through 12, I, I will confess I, I find that statement a little hard to reconcile uh, with the public record, because if you look at the Georgetown Day Schools curriculum, it is filled and overflowing with critical race theory. That, that among the, doc, the books that are either assigned or recommended, uh, they include critical race theory, an introduction. Uh, they include the end of policing and ad, an advocacy for abolishing police. They include how to be an anti-racist by Ibram Kendi. They include literally stacks and stacks of books, and I'll tell you two of the ones that were most stunning. They include a book called Anti-Racist Baby uh, by I Ibram Kendi. And there are portions of this book that, that, that I find really quite remarkable. One portion of the book says babies are taught to be racist or anti-racist. There is no neutrality. Another portion of the book, they recommend to babies confess when being racist. Now, this is a book that is taught at Georgetown Day School to students in pre-K through second grade, so four through seven years old. Um, do, do you agree with this book that is being taught with kids that, that babies are racist? So we will be reading Anti-Racist Baby today. <laughs> Anti-racist baby is bred, not born. Anti-racist baby is raised to make society transform. Babies are taught to be racist or anti-racist. There is no neutrality. Take these nine steps to make equality a reality. One, open your eyes to all skin colors. Anti-racist baby learns all the colors, not because race is true. If you claim to be colorblind, you deny what's right in front of you. Two, use your words to talk about race. No one will see racism if we only stay silent. If we don't name racism, it won't stop being so violent. Three, Point at policies as the problem, not people. Some people get more, while others get less, because policies don't always grant equal access. Four, shout. There's nothing wrong with the people. Even though all races are not treated the same, we are all human, anti-racist baby can proclaim. Five, celebrate all our differences. Anti-racist baby doesn't see certain groups as better or worse. Anti-racist baby loves a world that is truly diverse. Six, knock down the stack of cultural blocks. Anti-racist baby appreciates how groups speak, dance, and create as they choose. Anti-racist baby welcomes all groups, voicing their unique views. Seven, confess when being racist. Nothing disrupts racism more than when we confess the racist ideas that we sometimes express. Eight, grow to be an anti-racist. Anti-racist baby is always learning changing and growing. Anti-racist baby stays curious about all people and is not all-knowing. Nine, believe we shall overcome racism. Anti-racist baby is filled with the power to transcend, my friend, and it doesn't judge a book by its cover, but reads until the end.
Thank you. Now I invite you to sing Go Now in Peace as our children and youth go to their religious education classes. Today we are continuing to experiment with a new way to do joys and concerns. It will better integrate people on Zoom with people here in our sanctuary. I'm going to read the joys and concerns that have been sent to Reverend Deborah. If you want a joy or concern read aloud, you can email Reverend Deborah on any Sunday morning by 8 a.m. and it will be read aloud here. You may also write your joy or concern on a piece of paper and give it to the worship associate up until the service begins. I now invite those of you on Zoom to enter the names of those you would like to lift up into the chat box so that I may read them aloud. If you wish, you can share a brief reason for your joy or concern. I'll begin with our concerns, concern for the people of Buffalo. Judy Gardner is in Huntington Hospital with pneumonia. Hopefully she will be home early this week. Cards to her home would be appreciated. Larry Wilco is in the hospital in Great Neck. Send him your good wishes. My neighbor whose house burned down last night. John, Christine, Vivian and Jen. My joy is that Tuesday is the 19th anniversary of my ordination as a UU minister from Reverend Deborah for all of these joys and concerns. We ask for your thoughts. Thank you, Gary. Would you all please join me in some quiet moments of meditation and prayer? Spirit of life and love, be with us today. Knit us as a community in the main hall, reaching out to those who are on Zoom, reaching out farther into our community, into the state, into the world. We send our prayers and our broken hearts to the people of Buffalo, and to people who have been victims of gun violence and their families everywhere. We send our prayers to two of our members who are in hospital and hope that they recover soon. We send our prayers to those increasing numbers of people we know who have COVID, including many among us and the people they love. We send our prayers to the people of the Ukraine the people of Sub-Saharan Africa who are struggling with person-made war and natural disasters. We open our hearts to parents of newborns and small children who worry will their children have adequate formula to sustain their bodies. And we sit with all those who have worries in their hearts and concerns, financial concerns, relationship concerns, 
concerns about how to deal with their inner demons and get through another day. There are so many ways we know people are suffering. And yet, and yet we have today, day, a new day to enjoy our lives, to be kind, to be compassionate, to celebrate, to celebrate the birthdays, to celebrate the births, the weddings, the proposals, the new jobs, the new life that springs all around us, the chance to be compassionate to each other, to reach out and to rededicate ourselves. So we say thank you. Thank you for this day. Thank you for each other. Remembering the only prayer we ever really need is thank you. Amen. And so may it be. And now we will hear the Spirit of Life video. Please feel free, feel free to sing along. split plate for the month of May is Helping Hand Rescue Mission, located in Huntington Station. The Helping Hand Rescue Mission seeks to improve the spiritual and temporal conditions of the children, families, and people of the communities they serve by providing excellent service to all who come, whether they be rich or poor. They are here to love, to serve and to give. They have been serving approximately 200 to 250 families per week with non-perishable and fresh produce, fruit, meat, eggs, milk, and bread. They have given out more than 39,000 food parcels since March 21st, 2020. Their dining room recently suffered water damage due to, the, to a burst pipe so contributions are especially needed now. We will be once again passing the collection basket as we listen to music by Isabella. If you are at home or didn't bring a check to church, you can send a check to the office or donate through the website. You can also donate through the Vanco mobile app, which can be found on the app, in the App Store or on Google Play. Please give as generously as you are able, and thank you. So as the ushers pass the basket, and as you sit at home, I invite you to listen to an amazing group, the Resistance Revival Chorus, a group of interracial group of women singing, Everyone Deserves to be Free. Colder. What 
So that's the, pretty much the sermon, right? Everyone deserves to be free. Will you stand with me? Four years ago, I attended a workshop where white people were asked, how did your family teach you to be anti-Black? And I quickly thought, oh, they didn't. Like many of you, I grew up in a liberal white home. We watched Dr. King and the March on Washington on TV. My parents held Jewish Black discussion groups in our living rooms in the late 1960s. I watched Julia on TV, and we listened to Sammy Davis Jr., Nina Simone, and Bill Cosby records. And then in that workshop, I was flooded with memories. My parents and other members of my family used an ugly word, schwarze, when they talked about Black people. The black woman who came to clean our house once a week was called the girl. I never learned her last name. I had the book, Little Black Sambo, and I learned counting games about catching black people by the toe. There were only two black families in our middle-class neighborhood. I only had white teachers until I was in high school. 
So my fellow white people who are here, think for me for, with a moment. Did your friends have many friends? Did your parents have many friends of color? How many people of color lived in your neighborhood? How many live there now? Not where did they live? Were you encouraged as a child to go visit and play in those neighborhoods? Did anyone encourage you to create authentic friendships with children of other races? Yeah, me neither. So today I'm asking those among us who are white to be uncomfortable and to question ourselves. I wanna ask you to think, how many of your closest friends are black? How many conversations about race have you had with them? If I looked at photos from your wedding, how many non-white people are there as guests? Dr. Robin DeAngelo in her book, Right Fragility, writes that white people grow up believing that whiteness is the norm and that people of color are the deviation. Being white, she writes, is not, quote, a mere racial classification. It is a social and institutional status and identity imbued with legal, political, economic, and social rights and privileges that are denied to others, end quote. And then she challenges us, quote, instead of the typical focus on how racism hurts people of color, let us examine whiteness to focus on how racism elevates white people. She says that learned anti-blackness is the root of our white supremacy. As white people, we must accept that we were raised in, live in, and benefit from a racist system. We like to believe, don't we, that the word racist only applies to those extremists, to the people who believe in replacement theory, the domestic terrorists who murder black and brown people. Dr. Ibrahim X. Kendi, who wrote that lovely children's book and who will be this year's war, where lecturer, writes that everyone in the United States is racist. He says, we have to change thinking that racism is a pejorative or a slur. Dr. D'Angelo says that being racist doesn't mean you're a bad person. So as long as we identify racists as only evil and sinful, we really can't see that all people, white people benefit from white supremacy. Kendi writes in his book, the opposite of racist isn't not racist, it's anti-racist. What's the difference? One endorses either the idea of racial hierarchy as a racist or racial equality as an anti-racist. One either believes problems are rooted in groups of people as a racist or locates the roots problems in power and policies as anti-racist. One either allows racial inequities to persevere as a racist or confronts racial inequities as an anti-racist. There is no in-between safe space of not racist. Now, I know my friends, Labeling ourselves as racist is hard. I understand that. We're good people. We would never join a hate group. We would never intentionally treat people differently. We stand for racial equality. Geez, we're Unitarian Universalists. Yet in 2017, Black Unitarian Universalists told us that the UUA was a white supremacist organization. Younger UU leaders of colors demanded that we acknowledge that racism and white supremacy are embedded in our beloved UUA and among its white members. Now, I gotta tell you, when that first happened, I had a really hard time with that. My initial response was to reject that call. And it took me a lot of reading and listening and conversations to accept that we indeed live in a culture and our organizations are based in white supremacy, that we as white people have benefited from that culture and that we must commit to being anti-racist with our actions, not just our rhetoric. Robin D'Angelo in her new book, Nice Racism, How Progressive White People Perpetuate Racial Harms, directs her book to people who she says 
quote, see themselves as racially progressive, well-meaning, and nice. He's writing to us, most of us, my friends who are white, people like us who do not see ourselves as part of the problem, people like us who are appalled by the far right. And the belief that we are woke, she says, prevents us from further growth and development. So I don't know about you, but I don't like thinking of myself as a nice racist. And yet I confess to you, there are parts of that that might be true. I am ashamed to tell you that among my closest friends, all of them are white except for one. I am more vigilant when I pass a group of black male teenagers than white ones. Although I basically don't like groups of roving teenage boys of any kind. I lock my car doors in certain neighborhoods. I'm embarrassed to tell you I have sometimes confused one minister of color who I don't know well for another minister from the same racial background. And I feel upset when an activist who is a person of color doesn't immediately accept that I'm an ally. I gotta admit, sometimes I've even felt that I just don't want to attend one more anti-racism workshop. I'm sure I have more examples of how I have failed as an anti-racist. You likely have yours too. I'm really glad that you have committed to being an eighth principle congregation. To remind you, if you are newer to us, that means that in addition to the seven UU principles, UUFH has affirmed that you will, quote, commit to journeying towards spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse, multicultural, beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and in our institutions. My friends, passing the eighth principle is just a first step. Several congregants have already asked me what I think we can do to live into it. And as a newcomer to Long Island, I'm gonna start by asking, what do you think you should do? See, I'm just learning about this community that I'm gonna call home for the next two years. And I'm frankly appalled by what I've learned. I learned this week that Long Island is among the 10 most racially segregated metropolitan regions in the United States. 90% of Long Island's black population lives in just 62 of its more than 290 communities. In fact, Nassau County is the most segregated county in the entire United States and Suffolk County is the 10th. The contrast in the demographics of Huntington, where we, our church is located in nearby Huntington Station is stark. Huntington is almost 90% white and only one and a half percent black and 5% Hispanic. In nearby Huntington Station, where a majority of the people of the population are people of color, the poverty rate is two and a half times higher than it is in this zip code. The average house value is four times higher in Huntington than in Huntington Station. The median household income is lower, school test scores are lower, I'm guessing life expectancy is lower. The list of racial inequities applies to education, incarceration, employment, drug use, teenage pregnancy, and on and on. And what I know you know is that believing those statistics are about individual people, that's racist that understanding that racial inequity is about systemic oppression and committing to end this horrifying type of inequity in your own neighborhood is being anti-racist. So the question, my friends, the question is what more can we do to support people of color in our community, in our congregation, in Huntington Station, in New York State, in the US, around the world? How, for those of us who are white, can we use our white lives to speak out for the lives and rights of all Black people, of all people of color, to affirm that Black and Brown and Asian and Pacific Islanders' lives and Indigenous lives matter as much as our white lives do? There's a list of 106 actions white people can take to combat racism on Medium. And I'm gonna put an article about that in next week's flash. 
Here's what they say is number 60. Seek out a diverse group of friends. Practice real friendship and intimacy by listening when people of color talk about their experiences and their perspectives. What would it mean for you to do that? Here are some of Dr. D'Angelo's suggestion. Read books by people of color. Give money to organizations led by BIPOC people. Donate your time and services to local BIPOC-led organizations, but let them lead. Panel work to BIPOC people and organizations. Support Black independent bookstores rather than buying from Amazon. The list is long. Can we each commit to doing at least one of these in the next week? I know that some of you have been active with the Poor People's Campaign, the NAACP, the organization Erase Racism. And I look forward to your suggestions about which BIPOC organizations and leaders I should get to know when I begin with you in September full time. What I wanna promise you today is that every one of our worship services will decenter whiteness. Every sermon you have heard from me and will hear from me will include the voices of people of color and we will include more diverse music. I wonder if it's a time for us to hang a Black Lives Matter flag outside our church. Let me know what ideas we have. I know these aren't easy issues, and I expect that there is considerable disagreement and perhaps discomfort, perhaps discomfort about them in this room. And that's okay. I'm not trying to shame anybody. I'm trying to raise a question. But what's important is that we commit to doing what we can. Each of us as individuals, together as beloved community. What I wanna tell you is I have begun to know your hearts in these last three months. And I know that with your commitment, UUFH can become more diverse, more inclusive, more anti-racist as you pledged to do last June. My colleague, the Reverend Lynn Unger wrote a poem several years ago that I'm going to end with. He writes, breathe, said the wind. How can I breathe at a time like this when the air is full of the smoke of burning tires and burning lives? Just breathe, the wind insisted. Easy for you to say if the weight of injustice isn't wrapped around your throat, cutting off all your air. I need you to breathe, said the wind. Don't tell me to be calm when there are so many reasons to be angry, so much cause for despair. I didn't say to be calm, said the wind. I said to breathe. We're gonna need a whole lot of air to make this hurricane together. My friends, there is so much we all need to learn and to unlearn. As we will hear in the closing hymn, in Ella's song, we who believe in freedom cannot rest. So I invite you, let us confess our own racism and let us bow to do better, to be here and now. Breathe with me, my friends. May we make a hurricane of justice, a whole lot of good trouble together. Amen. So may it. Our closing hymn today is entitled Ella's Song, performed by the Resistance Revival Chorus. The words of the chorus are on the video. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. Mm. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it
need to be just one and the number as we stand against tyranny. To me, young people come first. They come first. They have the courage where we fail. If I can just shine a light on as they carry us through the gale, we will believe in freedom and our freedom can rest. We who I hope that you were up and dancing and singing in the sanctuary or singing along in your homes. This movement, although very heavy and, 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 and so heartbreaking is also filled with joy. And I wanted to share that joy with you in this and then in our closing uh, postlude. For those of you at home, please feel free to use the chat room as a virtual receiving line, giving us your feedback on today's service. If you're in the sanctuary, I would love you to drop me a line, uh, minister at UUFH, and give me any feedback you have. The closing words this morning are from a, a poem by Richard Blanco. Richard Blanco was the poet laureate, and he was uh, was the person who spoke at Obama's presidential inauguration. He's an American Latinx. This poem speaks to the hope of a United States that is fully diverse, equitable, and inclusive of us all. And so here's an excerpt. The dust of farms and deserts, cities and plains mingled by one wind, our breath. Breathe. Hear it through the day's gorgeous din of honking cabs, Buses launching down avenues, the symphony of footsteps, guitars, and screeching subways, the unexpected songbird on your line. Here, squeaky playground swings, trains whistling, whispers across cafe tables. Here, the doors we open for each other all day saying, hello, shalom, bonjourno, howdy, namaste, or buenos dias in the language my mother taught me in every language spoken into one wind, carrying our lives without prejudice as these words break from my lips. One sky towards which we sometimes lift our eyes tired from the work, some days guessing at the weather of our lives, 
Some days giving thanks for the love that loves us back. Sometimes praising a mother who knew how to give or forgiving a father who couldn't give what you wanted. We head home through the gloss of rain or weight of snow or the plum blush of dusk, but always, always under one sky, our sky, and always one moon like a silent drum tapping on every rooftop and every window of one country. All of us facing the stars with hope, a new constellation waiting for us to map it, waiting for us to be it. So I end this service, my friends, with the words I say each week, go in peace. May our real service be. As Terry extinguishes the chalice, I invite you to listen to the, pre to the postlude, which is a piece by John Batiste that won the Grammy. Please, please, please rise as you are able in your home or in the sanctuary. And I want you to sing and and, and move, I really want you to move, along with Grammy Award winner, John Batiste, the words will be on your video. John Batiste singing Freedom. Please sing and dance along. For those of you who are here with us today, you are now invited to join us to grab a cold drink out on the patio on the Sam Phillips Garden outside the Social Hall. For those of you who have joined us virtually, please have a wonderful day.